Okay, welcome to section 6 in chapter 10. This is a numeric derivation of the formula for interest. And we're going to talk about continuous compounding as well. So take a look at what we've got here. Um, we're going to invest $100 at 5% simple interest, and we're going to compound it annually. The formula for simple interest is I equals PRT. I is the interest, principal is P, rate is R, and T is time. Now to get the accumulated amount, we need to add what we invested to the amount of interest that we earn. So in other words, we don't just get the interest back, we get the principal and the interest back. That's called the accumulated amount. Now notice that those P's on the right side factor out. You can factor out the P's and left behind is 1 plus RT. So let's take a look at what happens when we are only looking at one year or one period. We'll call that T equals 1. And when we've got T equals 1, notice that this works out to P times 1 plus R. The 1 means we're getting all of the principal back. The R means that we're getting that interest back as well. We're going to work through this in an entirely numeric way, um, and we're going to gradually work towards the equation. So here we are. We're going to use our calculator, and we're going to do some arithmetic. So in the first year, at the beginning of the first year, we have $100 invested. Over the course of the year, it earns 5% uh, interest. And of course, that one reminding us that we get our $100 back as well. So at the end of that year, we've got $105. We started the year with $100. We ended the year with $105. Now that $105 is how the second year is going to start. So the second year starts with a principal of $105. Over the course of the year, we earn our principal back and 5% interest. And if you multiply that in a calculator, you get $110.25. Now that $110.25 becomes the beginning amount for the third year. So the second year started with an investment of $105. It ended with $110.25. Notice that 25 cents. That's the interest on the $5 that we in earned in the first period. It's interest on interest. That's where the word compound interest comes from. So the third year starts with an investment of $110.25. Over the course of the year, we get our principal back, that's the 1, and 5% interest. And with rounding, we end up with $115.76. So that's entirely numeric. Now let's look at the numbers, but let's not use a calculator. So let's not do any arithmetic. So in that first year, we start with a principal of $100. Over the course of the year, we get the $100 back. That's the one for the whole thing. And we get 5% interest. Now notice if we're not doing any arithmetic, we're going to just, going to just show this as 100 times the sum of 1 and 5%. Um, the second year starts with that as the investment, 100 times 1 um, plus 0 0.0. Five. And of course, that addition is in parentheses. Over the course of the year, we're going to multiply that by another factor of 1 plus 0 0.05. That's two factors of 1 plus 0 0.05. Well, we might as well show that as a square. Now, the third year starts with the square. Right, We've got that same amount, just copied and pasted like we did before. Over the course of the year, it earns 5% interest and, of course, the principal back. So now we've got three factors of 1 plus 0 0.05. So we're cubing that. Now, the 15th year, we're going to say, well, that, you know, the, something happened at the end of the 14th year that got reinvested, but we can see the pattern. Um, the exponent is now 15. And we're going to generalize this because number or no number, after t years, the exponent is t. This is an exponential equation. We've been talking about those uh, a lot. And that's true because the exponent is a variable. t is our number of years in this case. 
Okay, now let's do the same thing, but without any numbers at all. So in the first year, we start with a principle of P. Over the course of the year, we get the whole amount back, that's the one, and we get the interest, that's P times R. So at the end of that first year, we have P times the sum of one and R. The second year starts with that ending amount from the previous year, P times one plus R. Over the course of the year, we get the whole amount back and the interest on that amount. That means that we're multiplying one plus R times one plus R. That means we're squaring one plus R. You can see the same pattern here again, just without any numbers. The third year starts with the amount that the second year ended with. Over the course of the third year, yet again, we multiply by one plus R. That gives us three factors of one plus R. Now, let's generalize this. We can keep going, but let's skip to 15 years. At the end of 15 years, we're, we're talking about the end of 15 years, no great surprise, the exponent is 15. And then in this last case, we're going to look at what happens at the end of t years, and of course the exponent is t. Now let's be a little bit more careful about our rate. So let's talk about some rates. Let's um, uh, talk about quarterly compounding. That means four times per year. So if I have an interest rate, an annual rate of 4%, the decimal form of that, when we convert it into a decimal, is 0 0.04. That's the annual rate. There's four quarters in a year. So the quarterly rate is 1%. We divide it by four. So let's take a look at an example like 8%. So if the annual rate is 8%, we can make that into its decimal form, 0 0.08, and the quarterly rate will be a fourth of that. We take 0 0.08 and divide it by 4. Um, let's continue in this way. Let's talk about 5%. We convert it into a decimal, and then we divide it by 4. Now, what if we had any old rate, just an R. The quarterly rate would be R divided by four. So let's look at what happens when we compound quarterly. Now the rate is R divided by four because we're computing interest for each quarter. So in that first quarter, we start with a principle of P. Over the course of the quarter, we get all of that back and a fourth of the interest rate. So at the end, we've got the principal, that's the one, and we've got the interest, that's the P times R over four. But that's only the interest for the first quarter. So the second quarter begins with what the first quarter ended with, P times one plus R over four. Over the course of that second quarter, we get the principal back and the interest coming to us from r divided by four times that amount. Well, that means we've got two factors of one plus r over four, and we can write that as a square. So we've got r square. Now, the same thing, the same pattern takes place. The third quarter starts with the amount from the uh, ending amount from the second quarter, and at the end of the third quarter, the exponent is three. At the end of the fourth quarter, the exponent is four. Now we're gonna, instead of talking about quarters, which is what we've been talking about, we were looking at the four quarters here, we're now going to jump to years. So remind yourself that each year has four quarters. So when we look at what happens over the course of this year, we're talking, or the second year, we're talking about another four quarters. And another four quarters brings us to eight. So at the end of the third year, we're going to have um, four more quarters, and that'll take us to a total of 12 quarters. At the end of the fourth year, we're going to have Four times four is 16 quarters. And then of course our goal here is to ask the question, what happens at the end of t years? Well, each year has four quarters, so we're gonna multiply that four times t, giving us um, four t as our exponent. Okay, now we're in the position to ask the question, what happens when we compound n times per year? Quarterly was the example that we just looked at. That meant that we com 
compounded four times per year. But let's ask the question, what happens if we compound n times per year? So in this first example, let, let's say the annual rate was 5%. The decimal form of that is 0 0.05. If we compound n times per year, then our rate for each of those compounding periods is 0 0.05 divided by n. Now we can do the same thing with other rates. So let's look at 10%. 10% as a decimal is 0.1, and we can divide 0.1 by n. Or our goal is to look at any old rate. R is our annual rate in decimal form. If we compound n times per year, then we've got a rate for each of those compounding periods of r over n. So taking the place of r over 4 in the previous example is r over n. We've got n compounding periods per year. So in this one year period, notice we've got n compounding periods. So when we look at this, we're going to take p and multiply it by 1 plus r over n. And that's going to give us an accumulated amount at the end of that first period of p times 1 plus r over n. And this continues n times. And at the end of that n, nth period, the end of that first year, we've got n of those compounding periods. And the exponent is n. Now, let's see what happens at the end of the second year. Now, at the end of the second year, there's been n more compounding periods. There were n in the first year and n in the second year for a total of 2n compounding periods. So that exponent is now 2n. At the end of the third year, no great surprise, 3n. At the end of the fourth year, 4n. And hopefully you can see the pattern. Our goal here is to talk about what happens at the end of t years. And at the end of t years, we've got an exponent of nt. Um, we put the t at the end. Uh, multiplication is commutative. Now we can talk about our formula, which is perfect. And it's exactly what we just derived. So a, the accumulated amount, is p times the sum of 1 and r over n all to the nt power. Um, a is the accumulated or the future amount. P is the principal, the amount invested. R is the rate as a decimal. N is the number of compounding periods each year. And t is the number of years. OK, let's look at some numbers for exponential growth using our brand new formula. Let's ask the question, what happens with constant 5% growth? Now, the word constant there tells you that the growth rate is constant, which means that the growth is exponential. So in these three columns, we're going to see what happens as we grow at a constant 5% growth rate. So we're going to start with $1,000. And we're going to grow by 5%. That's $50. So the ending period is $1,050. Notice that this came out of a spreadsheet. So all I'm doing here is uh, allowing a spreadsheet to do a lot of arithmetic for me. That ending amount of $1,050 became the starting amount in the second period. The spreadsheet computed the amount of interest by multiplying by 1.05 and getting that ending amount, 1000 $102.50. The $2.50 is interest on the $50 that we earned in the previous period. We're earning interest on interest. This is compound interest. Of course, that ending amount becomes the starting amount. We earn um, interest on that new larger amount. Now look at what's happening to the growth here. This was our first example right at the very beginning of chapter 10. And we saw that if the growth rate is constant, then the amount of growth has to increase. But I think you'll agree, this is pretty dramatic. If the growth in the first time period was $50, by the last time period, it's $150. It gets to about $100 after 15 periods. I mean, it's doubled um, in 15 years and, and then gone up to 150 approximately in 24 periods. Now let's compare that 
to what would happen if we were just growing by a constant amount of growth. That is, if every year the account uh, grew by just 50. And notice that the difference is striking, is stark. That ending amount is $2,200 if we were simply growing by 50 every year. But by growing by a constant growth rate, the ending amount for the 5% um, growth is $3,200. That's about $1,000 more. So a constant growth rate means that the growth must increase, and sometimes very dramatically. Now this is exponential. So I took these last two columns. I took the ending amount for the exponential growth, and I took the amount for the constant growth, and I graphed them. And this is what I got. So notice in blue is the constant growth. That's $50 more every year. And that's a line. The red dots are exponential growth. That's not a line, it's a curve. It's an exponential curve. It's actually increasing the amount of growth each period. In other words, that last amount of growth, $153.58, is three times the amount of growth in the first period. Exponential growth comes to us from a constant growth rate. And now we've got formulas that we can use in spreadsheets, and we can see this for ourselves. Now, the moment you see that you're earning interest on earn interest, you might think to yourself, I want more of this. I want that compounding frequency to increase. I want the number of compounding periods, n, to be as big as possible instead of quarterly, maybe monthly, or daily, or hourly, or minutely. And once you ask this question, you may say, well, what happened if you um, compounded all the time? So here's an interesting question. This gives us a new concept. It's called continuous compounding. So we're going to compound essentially all the time. And we're going to see what the amount of interest we get on the far side of that will be. So we're going to take our equation for interest, the one that we used in the previous um, page to make our beautiful exponential curve, the one that we just derived in the previous pages. We're going to take out the important part. And that is this part in here, the 1 plus r over n to the nth power. We're going to see what happens. That's the part that's got the n in it. We're going to see what happens as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And what happens is actually pretty cool. Um, and this is related to all sorts of topics in the sciences, in the rest of mathematics. So we're using a kind of silly example of compound interest. But I want you to see that this works for populations, for viruses, for all sorts of things out there. So we're going to take rates and we're going to see what happens. So in this first column, we're talking about a rate of 10%. So if the rate is 10%, then in our formula that's involving n, we plug in that 10%. Now, the way I did this is I used a spreadsheet, and I asked the spreadsheet to compute this formula for different values of n. So this column here is some values for n. Now, these aren't just made up numbers. They are actually corresponding to different frequencies that you may be interested in. So yearly, n equals 1. Monthly, n equals 12. Da daily, 365 is a good enough approximation. Hourly, and so on. So we plug those in. And we get a whole bunch of numbers. You can do the same in your calculator if you want to. Um, it's probably a good exercise to make sure that you can. So when n equals 1, 1 plus 0.1 over 1 to the first power is 1.1. Not very interesting. But it gets interesting pretty quickly. There's 1.1 and some change. We're earning interest on interest over those 12 months. And then daily, that number is getting um, bigger but not terribly quickly. In other words, its rate of growth is slowing down. It's getting closer to a particular value. And that particular value actually is e to the 0.1 power. You can do this in your calculator. I recommend that you do. We'll be raising e's to power a lot. So this is a good chance to get out your calculator and raise e to the 0.1 power and make sure you got what I got. 
Um, now, more interesting, perhaps, is to figure out what this e is. And notice that by raising e to the 0.1 power, we see what this number is approaching for this sequence involving r equals 0.1. So let's do the same thing where r equals 1. So now we're in the column where the rate is 1. We're going to plug it into that formula. So notice that r is now 1. I let the spreadsheet do this for me. So I did um, quite a bit of this, copied and pasted it in. And notice that by the end here, we are really close to e itself. Now I've shown this as e to the first power because that's how you have to enter it into your calculator and because I want you to see the pattern that that r is our exponent. Um, but this is basically e. e is approximately 2.71828182. Um, not exact, um, but good enough for our purposes and we can certainly see these numbers getting closer to e um, not growing without bound. They have a limit. And that's, that's really cool. Now when r equals 2, the pattern holds perfectly. So I plug in r equals 2 into the spreadsheet and I get all these beautiful numbers. 3, 6.3, 7 7.3, 4, 0.38, 0.389, um, getting closer to e squared. So when r is 2, we've got e squared. Now remember what we did here. We took the formula for compound interest and we kind of extracted the bit that had the ends in it. We then looked at what the ends do uh, based on the value of r. And we learned that the ends go away as the compound frequency gets really big. And what we're left with is e to the r. So we say this in a very dramatic way. We say that this means that as n increases, that part of the formula for compound interest that contains n and r approaches e to the r. So we can plug that back in. It means that that bit that has the n's and the r's in it, as the n's get really big, all that becomes is e to the r power. Now, that's a much nicer equation by any standards. Um, one base, several exponents, that simply tells us to multiply the r times the t. So we do that, and we get our new formula for continuous compound interest. a equals p times e to the rt power. And with that, we conclude our discussion of interest.